ChatGPT is everywhere and everyone's using it. So ChatGPT is a really powerful AI tool that enables conversation in a human-like form, but via computer. So it's been used to ask questions, gives you answers, and whilst you can use it in a number of different ways, there are quite a few ways that you can use it within academia, within education, to help you cut down the number of hours you spend researching, doing things, outlining, preparing for presentations, for interviews, and I'm going to be going through a few of those ways that I've discovered and have been trying out a little bit. Um, I thought I'd ask some questions and show you how you can save hours and hours of time of part of your research, part of your um, research process to use ChatGPT and AI. And there's just this is just the beginning. There are so many different ones that are coming out. I literally got an email this morning saying that Bing has been released and I've got early access to start using it, which is another AI platform. And it's just gonna go, it's, it's gonna be huge. It is going to be huge. So it's a good thing to get to know how to use it. And I want to just say that it's really important that you need to get to know how to use it ethically. So by ethically, I mean being able to use it in a way that is not plagiarism. So you're not just telling it to write you a bit of information and copying and pasting that, but rather using it to help you evaluate, outline, summarize, just pick out and, and kind of brainstorm and be that first step before you actually get into it. So let's get into the fun stuff. Um, I'm going to start asking some questions. Okay, so my first question is, I'm going to ask it to write an academic outline for a seminar paper about the acting cortex and cancer. So this is just for a paper um, and I just want an academic outline. So it is thinking. By the way, if you even manage to get onto the platform these days, it is an absolute miracle. Um, but yeah, introduction. It's split it into three different sections, the definition, the importance and the role. Okay, it's pretty good and then it's broken it down even more. So you've got the acting cortex structure and function, the overview, the mechanisms, and then it's even specified like with in-cell behavior. And then, okay, it's pretty good. All right, I, I like that. Um, I like that it's given quite a nice breakdown of the different sections. Um, and this would be a good place to start if you're thinking about writing about this topic. And like I said, this is just a way of beginning, maybe your research, maybe you're thinking, okay, um, I want to write about the acting cortex and cancer, which is what my PhD was about, which is why I'm searching for these topics because I know what to expect. Um, and so obviously this is coming up and it's saying in cancer, its causes, the role, the impact, the therapeutic approaches. So like, it's giving you a lot of ideas that maybe if you hadn't thought of before, this is a good way to begin. So I like it so far. The next one I'm going to ask it to do is to generate 10 academic research questions about the acting cortex and cancer. So this would be nice if let's say you want to start a project or you want to think of a kind of a novel or a new idea um, about a particular area or topic you can ask it to give you some questions well how does the acting cortex play a role in cancer what is the relationship um okay can it contribute to the development of drug resistance okay I, I do think it's doing a good job but it is quite general like it hasn't given very much detail there's no like protein names or drug names it's very much just kind of like um, can this, what role does it have? Can it serve as, what is the effect? So yeah, okay. Okay, so far, I think it's a good starting point. You know, if you're sitting here and you want to think of a research question and you have an absolute blank, you know, blank slate, this is going to give you a few places to begin. It's saying to me um, to look at prognostic markers or to look at interactions or to look at um, alterations or deletions. And it kind of gives you somewhere to begin. And a lot of the time that sort of, writer's block is what stops you from progressing. Let's try something else. The third way that you can use it is for things like scholarship outlines. So I've asked it to outline the structure for a scholarship, for the Rhodes Scholarship, which is a program, it's quite prestigious. Um, it's an Oxford based scholarship program. And I've said for a student with a STEM background. Um, so the thing about Ch ChatGPT is you really want it to you want to talk to it as if you are speaking to a human. So even though I've probably said it in quite a formal way, you can literally speak to it as if you are speaking to me. Like, can you tell me about um, the scholarship program and how I should write, like literally like it's a conversation. So this is a really good structure. And this is what I mean about using it ethically. This is not writing it for you. I mean, you can ask it to write it for you, but that would be unethical. So you want to be able to ask it to 
to write the structure for you. And then based on that, you can then go and input your information. So as you can see, leadership and service, that's amazing, yeah, because that's what they look for. Future goals, your academic background, and all of that is within this structure. And if you're expected to write like 500 words, you would just write that yourself. So academic background, fits for the Rhodes Scholarship, conclusion, cool, I like that. That is really good. And you know, a lot of the time, I guess the, the issue with writing like things like this, like scholarship programs or personal statements is just not knowing what to add into each section. So the fact that this gives you a full breakdown means that you can go away and add that information yourself without having to worry about not including the right thing. Okay, let's do the next thing. Scholarship, uh, so I actually write it for you. So I'm gonna say write 500 words um, for the scholarship with a STEM background. And let's see, so this is, this, is, would, this would be an example of just looking at what it can give you. You should never copy and paste from um, AI, from ChatGPT. And the reason why is because there are software that you can use, and I believe it's called ChatGPT Zero, which tells the person um, that's copying and pasting this information whether or not it has been written by a human or AI. It's not 100% correct either way, but if a university or if an institution is using software like that, and this comes up as saying that it's been written by AI, then obviously you've lost your position. So it's not worth copying and pasting, but it is worth taking a look at and seeing what an example could be. So this is writing it for a STEM student, and I can see that it's, it's writing a pretty good one. Okay, so it said, it's giving like a, a nice introduction. I'm a background in STEM because I asked for STEM. So of course, if you're going to write this, you'd be more specific. Your academic journey, where it began and something more personal. You're captivated by the power of mathematics. Um, so that's something that kind of how you want to begin. And this is sort of a personal statement anyway. So you want to be more specific about yourself. And then you're, in addition to my academic pursuits, I've also been actively involved in various extracurricular activities. Um, and this is giving a quite a, an in-depth description of what they've done and what they were involved in, which is really important. Long-term goals, um, because the Rhodes Scholarship is looking for someone who is able to kind of give back and um, address some sort of um, challenge. So they've said climate change and they're confident that Oxford will be able to give them this opportunity. And yeah, I mean, this is pretty good. Like I said, do not copy and paste. Definitely use this as an example, use the outline and structure it and write it yourself. Okay, the next way is for a presentation. So I've said to outline a 10 slide presentation for a PhD thesis viva. So as you can probably see, that's quite consistent throughout is I'm asking it to do outlines. I'm asking it to give me the structure. I'm asking it to help me understand what is expected of me from the structure. And then obviously you pad it out yourself. So for a 10 slide presentation, Introduce yourself and the topic, the research background, yep, the research objectives, the method, your results, a discussion, a conclusion, and then probably something to do with future work, okay, contributions, and then maybe future work, as a 10 slide, yeah, future work, and then references, summary. Okay, so this is pretty good. Um, I think that's a good summary of what you want to include for a PhD um, thesis viva outline. And like, this is just showing you the capability of what you can get from this. Um, okay, next one. Let's try a PhD interview prep. So I'm gonna ask it, what are 10 questions that could be asked at a PhD interview for a cardiovascular program? Again, I'm just using this to get some questions. Oh, network error. This is the thing with ChatGPT, so many people are using it that it's so hard to even get onto the platform. Okay, go on. Here are 10 questions that could be asked at a PhD interview, and there are questions. And you want to be really specific, and like I said, be really conversational with it, like, oh, what could a supervisor ask me for a PhD interview? 10 questions, please. Um, and then you can get 10 questions. Um, about your background, your inspiration, your research experience, how do you stay current? That's a good question. Number four is a good question. I've been asked that before. Um, can you describe a, sense of res a potential research project? How do you approach problem solving, your experience, a time when you had to do so and so? 
How do you plan to contribute? Can you discuss your long-term career goals? Yep. I mean, these are all very general questions that you can probably get online anyway, but the fact that they've like tailored it towards cardiovascular, a cardiovascular program allows you to practice. And when you know, when you're, when you're practicing and when you're like having your mock interview and you're preparing, having those questions that are quite specific mean that these are good questions to prepare from. You can't, you can't cheat with these questions. Uh, this is just giving you a starting point from where you can actually prepare. So I then asked, and I'm asking a follow-up question, what should I wear to a PhD interview at the University of Cambridge? I'm five foot three, um, I'm a five foot three woman in her thirties. So I just thought, let me see if it has any biases, because <laughs> this would be interesting. I thought maybe it would say like, wear a dress or wear heels or something. It says the aim for a professional and conservative look, wear a suit or a dress in a neutral color, yep. Anything, don't wear anything too revealing. Um, or with high heels, interesting. Um, it's also a good idea to dress comfortably. And uh, don't wear anything too tight. <laughs> Overall, it should affect the professionalism. Yeah, I mean, I think this is okay. I don't think it's anything controversial. Dress appropriately, don't wear anything too tight or restrictive. Uh, reflect your professionalism, show interest in your program. I mean, I don't think anything, I thought it would be more controversial than this. I quite like that, I think that's very true. Um, okay, next way, number six, is um, career options. So I'm gonna ask it, what are 10 alternatives to a career in academia, oh, academic, <laughs> after a PhD in cell biology? So it's thinking, what are 10 alternatives? Here are 10 potential career paths, let's see. So this would be someone like me, did a PhD in cell biology, what were my options or what are my options? Okay, industry, yep, I know someone that went into industry. Government, yep, also know someone that went to government. Science writing, I also know someone in science writing journalism. Science education, I guess I'm kind of there. Science policy and advocacy, yep, I know someone that's there as well. Consulting, yep, I also know someone there. Biotech and medical device sales, uh, biotech pharmacy, patent law, I know someone there as well. Business, yep, that's me. Science entrepreneurship, yep, that's me. I pretty much know someone in <laughs> each of these. The only one I don't know is science, no, biotech and medical device sales. I don't know someone in that. Ah, uh, do I? No, I don't. But otherwise, yeah, these are all complete. And you know what? These are all actually ideas that I probably would have thought about when I was in my PhD thinking about what to do. So it's a good, a good way of brainstorming. I like that. All right, moving on to referencing. So one thing to note with referencing is ChatGPT does spew out fake references. So if you're searching just generally, like, can you give me information about cell biology with references and it, the references in there are going to be fake. So do not copy and paste those references. But um, you can use it to format your references for you, which is also really helpful. Um, so for example, if you have a citation or you have a, yeah, you have something and you have some dates and text and you want it to be formatted in a certain way, you can ask it to do it for you. So for example, I've asked it now, what is the standard format for Harvard referencing? And it gives you the format of how you should do it. So this is in-text citations, this is what you want to do. For the reference list, this is how you want to include it and it will give you all the details, which is, which is obviously um, really good. It summarizes uh, what the order would be, author surname, initials, title, etc. So that's great. Um, and then let's say you actually give it something to reference. So I'm going to use my, a paper of mine and I'm literally just going to copy and paste the names, the um, title, just the whole thing. So copy and paste it and then I'm going to input it into ChatGPT and I'm going to say to, can you write this into standard Harvard referencing? Um, and see what it does. So it should clean up for me. And I mean, this is quite helpful because, you know, sometimes you have a massive reference or you have a reference from a book or an article or something else and you want to just have it in a standard way, that can do it for you. So just be aware. If you're taking references that you have an input, be aware of those. If you're inputting it for you to be referenced um, and formatted, then that, that could work. Okay, the last one, and this one actually, I was thinking, I was like, what else can I, like how else can I ask it to help me in academia? And I thought about productivity, more specifically lab book productivity. So I asked it, how can I organize my lab book productively as a PhD student in cancer research? So I just wanted to see because I, I just, I, let me see. I think I was quite a productive lab book person. <laughs> so let's see if it's gonna give me suggestions that are quite similar to mine. Um, so it's, 
essential for tracking your progress. Yes, recording your experiments. Yes, and ensuring you have a live or work and every work. Cool. Okay. Table of contents. Yes, you want to make sure that you've got it really clear because something to note is when you give back your lab book to your supervisor when you leave, which you don't take home with you, it's part of the lab, so you leave it with them. They need to be able to look through it and find what you've done. So it needs to be clear. Consistent with your formatting, yes. Um, I liked colors. Um, I had a section at the back for like my reagents and where they were at the front for something else. Um, record your experiments in detail, yes. <laughs> I'd even record it like by voice if I had to. Um, use clear and concise language, yep. Don't make it messy. Um, illustrate, yes. I used to illustrate my results quite a lot and just like show graphs of what I've done. Um, keep your lab book up to date, yep. I would do, I would always update it either the same day or like within, definitely within that week. So what I would do is like as I go along, I would write things like on wherever or where, however. Um, and then I'd kind of like update it in my lab book. And then it says back up your data regularly. Again, yes. You always want to make sure that you are backing up your lab book, either taking pictures. So the back where I'd keep in, I'd keep a record of like my reagents and stuff. So where I keep everything. Because you know you have those massive like liquid nitrogen storage tanks. I would have all my stuff in there. Um, and I'll take a picture of where I've put everything every so often just to make sure that I've got a lo like I've got the location of it. Otherwise, all your work is gone. And that's not good. Um, so yeah, I like that. That works too. <laughs> okay, well, this is fun. I mean, I hope that you guys were able to see how you can use ChatGPT in an ethical way as a researcher. Um, I went through a few examples. These are just a few examples. There are so many other ways. And if you want, I can do a part two to this and then show you a few other ways that you can try to use it. Um, let me know if you've tried it before. Let me know if you've even heard of it. I've spoke to someone recently who had no idea and I was like, are you living under a rock? <laughs> So if you haven't heard of it before, let me know if this is your first time hearing of it. I'll leave a link for it down below, but you just need to search ChatGPT. And if you're lucky enough to get on it, then you're lucky enough to get on it. But there are new versions coming out. So uh, yeah, keep, keep, keep on top of it, basically. Let me know if you enjoyed this video. And if you did, I will see you in my next one. Bye.